All right, everybody. So we're going to start things off a little bit differently today. There's going to be an activity. Uh, the activity <coughs> is posted as a PDF in the 4.2 folder. If you look in the 4.2 folder, you should be able to find an activity that is called, or a PDF that is called mvtactivity.pdf. I want you to go in there, open that up, and you're going to be doing the first part of today's lesson on that right there. So you really do want to work through this in order to be able to understand it. So come back here and there we go. So on the page, the first, uh, it looks like the first two pages on that PDF, you want to go through and follow these directions. For each graph, draw the secant line through, two, through the two points on the graph corresponding to the endpoints of the indicated interval. On the indicated interval, draw any tangent lines to the graph of the function that are parallel to the secant line you drew in part one. For each tangent line from part two, estimate the x value of the point of tangency. All right, so going over here, we can see h of x from zero to three. I'll just do this first one for you. You'll wanna pause the uh, screen and then come back to it. So when we say from zero to three, that means the x value of zero and the x value of three. So we actually want to connect those two points right there. And that right there is the secant that we're talking about. And ultimately what we want to figure out is find any tangent lines that are parallel to that. So moving my ruler up right here, I can actually find out that there's a tangent right there. And it looks like that value to me feels like 1.5 or so. All right, so pause this, come back, and check to see if you're right. I'm going to pause. All right, and hopefully we're getting somewhere in the ballpark of what I said here. So again, you're drawing the secant lines and trying to draw a tangent that is parallel to the secant. This one occurs on number two at about three. On number three, it looks like we have a horizontal secant. So the horizontal secant will occur at the maximum value of this uh, function, which is at about two. The uh, uh, number four secant right here with positive slope, it looks like the, the parallel tangent's right at about one. Again, these are approximate. So if you're in the right ballpark, you're good. Uh, for this one between zero and five, we got that negative slope and it looks like right at about 2.5. Same on number six. We got that. It looks like pretty much the same negative slope, uh, and uh, we have that negative or that two point five for the location. All right. Now we have pages ten through twelve are going to be in the same file, but on those pages you're going to do roughly the same thing that you did on. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the other part of this activity, but now instead of finding out where the tangents are, you're going to count how many tangents there are. So it's between zero and infinity. So you want to count how many tangents are available. So just to be clear on this, if I'm connecting like on number one, where I'm connecting one to three, looking from here to here, that is like that. I'm counting how many tangents I have that are parallel to this. It looks to me like there's only one point of tangency where the tangent line would be parallel to this. So I'm going to say one right here. If I want to see that, I could actually draw it in there just to see it. On my answer key, when you come back to look at it, you will see that all of them are, all the tangent lines are drawn. Now, something like number two where I have a closed dot down here, but an open dot up here. Since I'm connecting one to three, I want the closed dot to close dot. So that would be this guy right here. And I'm looking for tangents that are parallel to this line. All of the tangents over here are negative slopes, whereas the secant here is a positive slope. So that would be an example of zero. Try to go through uh, and answer these. And looking through here, again, I tried to show where those tangent lines were. On three, I got two of them. On four, I got one of them. Again, you're just gonna wanna make sure that you have the same answers as me. These numbers should be the same now. Uh, number five, zero. Number six, zero. Seven, I had one. 
Eight, I had one. Nine, I had four. And 10, I had, oops, didn't even put my answer. None on that one. So now what you wanna do, you wanna try to answer uh, A through G. So which graphs are continuous on the indicated interval? Notice that uh, we have the brackets, so that is including the endpoints. Which graphs are not continuous on the indicated interval? So between A and B, you should have all 10 graphs there. For C, which graphs are differentiable in the open interval? So we're ignoring the endpoints there. We're looking for corners, cusps, vertical tangents, and discontinuities here. Which graphs are not differentiable on the open interval? So between C and D, you should have a total of all 10 of the graphs there. For E, if a function is continuous on a closed interval, is there a tangent line that is parallel to the secant line? through the uh, points with x coordinates, x equals a and x equals b. If a function is differentiable on an open interval a to b, is there a tangent line that is parallel to the secant line through the points uh, with x coordinates, x equals a and x equals b? In the examples above, in order to ensure that the graph of a function has a tangent line that is parallel to the secant line, the function must be continuous on A to B and differentiable on A to B. For which functions do these two hold? Try to answer those and come back to me. All right, and now for some answers. For the uh, which graphs are continuous on the inter indicated interval, really the only tricky one there is number seven because it's talking about the indicated interval on seven since it's talking about from zero to three. It is continuous on that interval even though it becomes discontinuous at exactly three, uh, it is still continuous on the interval. So for A, you have one, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten. For B, you have two, six, and eight. For C, you should have one, two, three, four, seven, and nine. The one that's tricky there is number two. Since it's talking about differentiable on the open interval, we don't care that it's discontinuous at the endpoint as long as it's smooth and uh, continuous on the interval. That's what matters. So since it was the open interval, uh, we, were, we were able to include two there. For D, we have five, six, eight, and 10. For E, if a function is continuous on a closed interval, is there a tangent line that is parallel to the secant line? It is possible if it is continuous, but for those that had the cusp, we had the non-differentiability there. So if the function is non-differentiable, but it is continuous, it does not necessarily have a tangent line that is parallel to the secant line through those points. Same thing, well, not same thing, but similarly on F, it's possible, but it's not, it's not required here. So it's possible that you don't have a parallel uh, tangent line. Like on number two, where it was differentiable over the entire open interval, but because it was not uh, continuous on that closed interval, we did not have that parallel tangent here. So here, the ones that were both uh, 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 continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, those were one, three, four, seven, and nine. And as you can see, every single one of them had a parallel tangent on there. Now we're gonna flip over the page and do the next part. And I have magically flipped the paper over. So this right here is really just a summary of the mean value theorem, which is the point to this, uh, to this whole uh, uh, video today. It's called the mean value theorem. Mean value theorem requires us to find this value right here, where we have g of b minus g of a over b minus a, well, look up here at these two points. We have the starting point of A and the ending point of B. The height of A is G of A. The height of B is G of B. Looking at that, we now have the difference in height over the distance, the difference in distance here. So this is really just the slope of the line segment joining the points A, G of A, and B, g of b. That right there is the secant slope. g prime of c is the slope of the line tangent to the graph of y equals g of x at the point c 
g of c. On the graph, locate the x value x equals c that is ensured by the mean value theorem. And what we do is we just do what we did on these, uh, those previous problems. So we have our secant slope, and we just kind of scooch down until we find our point of tangency, which is right. Chahira, there's where I get my C and my G of C. All right, so the mean value theorem is all stated down here. If the function g is continuous on the closed interval from a to b and differentiable on the open interval from a to b, then there exist parallel lines, one through the points uh, a g of a and b g of b on the graph y equals g of x, and at least one tangent to the graph y equals g of x at a point with x coordinate x equals c in the interval from A to B. So if you want to see this in a different way, mean value theorem for derivatives, we do call it out as the mean value theorem for derivatives because there is a different mean value theorem, but we're not there yet. But the mean value theorem for derivatives says if f of x is, is a differentiable function over the closed interval from A to B, then at some point between A and B, f of B minus f of A over B minus A is equal to f prime of C. So what we just did on the uh, activity, you'll notice in this declaration, we just say differentiable over that closed interval so that we can get differentiable and continuous at the same time. If you're curious what this picture up here is, it's pretty much the same thing as that picture that we just marked up on the page uh, where you have the slope of the, I know in this picture they're calling it a chord, but it's that slope of that secant between A and B. At some point, as long as you don't have any of those cut corners, cusps, vertical tangents, or discontinuities, you are guaranteed to have some sort of uh, instantaneous slope equal to that average slope. Let's see if I can put it in a different way. Right here, mean value theorem says that at some point in the closed interval, the actual slope equals the average slope. Now, this seems like a pretty useless uh, theorem to have, right? So it seems pretty useless out there. But what we can actually say is we can actually put this to some sort of application. So uh, one of the best applications that I had for this one or that I've heard for this one is talking about crimes, all right? So let's look at this. Let's say I go on a journey from, uh, from here to Pittsburgh. And I know that from here to Pittsburgh, it's roughly, let's say, 90 miles or so, right? 90 miles from here to Pittsburgh. Let's say at time t equals zero, I have gone no distance whatsoever. Let's say one hour later, I am down in Pittsburgh and I have gone 90 miles between zero hours and one hour, I went 90 miles. Well, what I can figure out here is my average speed is going to be equal to that 90 minus zero over one minus zero. So my average speed was 90 miles per hour. That doesn't tell me that I'm going 90 miles per hour at any given point. That's just my average speed. Because I know that I can calculate my speed at any given point on my journey, I can actually guarantee that at least at one moment in my journey, I was going 90 miles an hour and I was therefore breaking the law. You can actually use this to uh, make some sort of um, uh, uh, some arrests if you're on the turnpike. Let's say at zero hours, I've gone no miles. I'm at the beginning of the turnpike. Let's say after four hours, I've gone, mm, let's say mm, 300 miles, right? So looking at that, I can find my average velocity would be the 300 minus zero 
over 4 minus 0. I have 300 over 4. 300 divided by 4, I believe it's 75, isn't it? 300 divided by 4. Yeah. 300 divided by 4. 75. So my average speed on the turnpike would have been 75 miles per hour. Again, because I can calculate my speed at any given point, I'm not saying when I was clocked going through that, uh, that turnpike toll plaza that I was going 75 miles per hour, but I can guarantee at some point I was going 75 miles per hour. So again, it's about what we can guarantee. If the function is continuous and differentiable over the interval, we can guarantee that the average rate of change is equal to the instantaneous rate of change at some point. We can't figure out what point. That requires a little bit of work. Now let's look at ooh, these three problems. We're going to do one at a time. So right now, we are just doing letter A. And on letter A, I want to know, uh, does the mean value theorem apply? And what can we determine from it? So the average or the mean value theorem, does it apply? OK, mean value theorem is the function continuous and differentiable over the interval. Well, I look at this, this is a polynomial, and I can see polynomials are always continuous and differentiable. So yes, this is continuous and differentiable over this interval. So what I can actually figure out from this, I can figure out that at some point, C, G prime of C, is going to be equal to G of one minus G of negative one over 1 minus negative 1. And I can actually do some stuff to figure out what C is and figure out where that occurs. In order to figure out what C is, I do need to find my average slope. So my M av. And that's going to be that second part of that equation, where we have G of 1 minus G of negative 1, G of 1 minus G of negative 1 over 1 minus negative 1. OK, so. 1 minus negative 1, the denominator is going to be 2, right? Numerator is going to be a little bit harder to find. 4 minus 1 plus 4, so 7 minus, let's see, negative 1, so I'd have negative 4 minus 1, so negative 5 plus 4, negative 5 plus 4, negative 5 plus 4 gives me negative 1 all over 2, right? So again, looking at the slope here, I'm going to have, uh, let's see, 8 divided by 2, also known as 4, right? So my average slope is 4. Now I want to find out where that average slope is attained on my, uh, uh, on my graph here, all right? So in order to figure that out, I need to find g prime of x. And g prime of x is going to be, uh, let's see, derivative of 4x cubed would be 12x squared minus derivative of, two, of x squared 2x. Derivative of 4 is 0. So g prime is 12x squared minus 2x. Now, in order to find out where this takes on the value of 4, I'm looking for where is g prime of c, which here would be equal to 12c squared minus 2c. Where is that equal to 4? All right, so now I just have to go and uh, solve this equation to figure this part out. So looking at solving this equation, again, this is just going to bring us back to algebra two on this one. I can set this equal to zero. So 12c squared minus 2c minus 4 equals zero. I see that I have a common factor of two. So just to make my life easier, I'm going to divide everything by two. I now have 6c squared minus two, nope, 6c squared minus c minus 2 is equal to 0. 
looking at that, I can now factor that to, um, uh, to be able to solve it. So looking at the factors, I've got, the, um, let me see here, 3c minus 2 times 2c plus 1 equals 0. Now I'm running out of space, so I'm just going to zoom over here. So zooming over here, I know from the zero product property, either 3c minus 2 is equal to 0 or 2c plus 1 equals 0. Solving these two individually, adding 2, adding 2, I got 3c is equal to 2, divide by 3. I've got one answer at c equals 2 thirds, and the other answer, minus 1, minus 1, 2c equals 0 minus 1 is not 0, 0 minus 1 is negative 1, divide by 2, I've got c equals negative 1 half. Sometimes these values will not be on the interval that we're uh, concerned with. We just have to verify that 2 thirds and negative 1 half are both between negative 1 and 1. So what we've actually determined is the point of tangency for the instantaneous rate of change is at 2 thirds and negative 1 half. Now looking at part B here where we have f of x is equal to 1 over x minus 1 in order to figure out if the mean value theorem applies on this one. Well, I, I can see very quickly that it does not because I've got a discontinuity at 1. So discontinuous at 1. Discontinuous at x equals 1 means no mean value theorem. Has to be continuous and differentiable over the interval for mean value theorem to apply. So B, no apply. Let's look at C now. Well, looking at C, I can see that I have a discontinuity, but the discontinuity occurs at negative 1 here because I divide by 0 at negative 1. So this one over the interval from 0 to 3 is actually continuous, it is differentiable, so the mean value theorem is going to apply here. So looking at this, I know at some point h prime of c is going to be equal to h of 3 minus h of 0 over 3 minus 0. All right, so looking at this, I happen to know that my average slope just calculating that out, h of 3 minus h of 0 over 3 minus 0. I happen to know that h of 3, looking over here, 1 over 3 plus 1 gives me 1 fourth minus uh, 1 over 0 plus 1, 1 fourth minus 1 over 3 minus 0. So looking at this, 1 fourth minus 1 gives me negative 3 quarters. Divide by 3 means times 1 third, which equals negative 1 quarter. What I'm guaranteeing between 0 and 3, this function has an instantaneous slope of negative 1 quarter at some point. And to find that, again, I have to find h prime of x which if I'm looking at this and I don't want to use the quotient rule, I could rewrite this as the derivative of x plus 1 to the negative first power. So looking at that, derivative of negative first power becomes negative the joni to the negative second power times the chain, but the chain here ends up being 1. So my h prime is going to be negative 1 over x plus 1 squared. Now I know at some point h prime of c, which again in this case would be negative 1 over quantity x plus 1 squared has to be equal to negative 1 quarter. And I just do anything that I can to solve this equation. Multiplying by negative 1, 
I can uh, uh, figure out that I have uh, x plus 1 squared equals, sorry, 1 over x plus 1 squared equals 1 fourth, and reciprocating, I can actually find out that x plus 1 squared equals 4. Taking the square root, I can find out that x plus 1 is equal to plus or minus 2. Subtracting 1, I can find out that the answers that I get are 1, negative 1, plus or minus 2. So my two answers are either at the we. Those shouldn't be x's, those should be c's. I apologize for that egregious error. Let me go back here and just change those variables to c so that I find my c values instead of my x values here. C, c. So c is going to either equal negative 3 or 1. That was the negative, three, negative 1 plus or minus 2. Now, negative 3 is not on this interval. However, 1 is. So the c value, where this takes on an instantaneous slope of negative 1 quarter, is c equals 1, because it's the only one on the interval. Bueno? All right, cool. We are going to move forward now. This next part is a corollary of the mean value theorem. Uh, and what we have here is a function is increasing over an interval if the derivative is always positive. A function is decreasing over an interval if the derivative is always negative. If you let f be continuous on a to b and differentiable on a to b, if f prime is greater than zero at each point from a to b, then f increases on a to b. If f prime is less than zero at each point of a to b, then f decreases on a to b. So we did stuff like this in the last section, but this allows us to analyze the graph a little bit better. We're going to use what is called a sign chart on the first derivative to figure out where a function is increasing or decreasing and use that to analyze what happens at those points in between, meaning we're going to find maxima and minima on functions here. All right? So let's look at a problem that we want to do here. Where is the function f of x equals x cubed minus 12x increasing, and where is it decreasing? And in order to find out where a function is increasing or decreasing, we want to find out where it changes from increasing to decreasing. So the places where a function is going to change from increasing to decreasing is either going to be where you have some sort of uh, disconnect between the graphs. So it's going to be at discontinuities where this function has some sort of uh, 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 divide by zero error, one of those discontinuities that we looked at two chapters ago. The other place where you're going to change from increasing to decreasing is at either a maximum or a minimum. So when we're analyzing this type of problem, the first thing that we need to do is find all of our critical points. Now remember, we talked about that last section, finding our critical points, we want to find f prime of x. And we want to find where f prime is either undefined or equal to zero. So we have f prime of x is equal to, and just taking the derivative here, it's 3x squared minus 12, right? So now to find our critical points, we want to set the numerator equal to zero and the denominator equal to zero. So I'm just going to make some notes right here. Critical points. Again, critical points occur when numerator equals zero or denominator equals zero. The denominator here is one. I don't even really want to write down one equals zero because that's not a thing. Now we just have to figure out how to solve this. I'm going to use just basic algebra. 3x squared equals 12 divided by 3. I get x squared equals 4. Take the square root. I get x equals plus or minus 2. Now, you do have to appreciate that that's two different values. That's positive and negative 2. Now, I'm going to teach you how to use a sign chart to analyze where a function is increasing or decreasing 
and also how to find local maxima and minima. You can't use this to find absolute maxima and minima because in order to find absolute, you have to find out if it's the biggest out of all of them, but this will help you find local maxima and minima. And the way that we do this, we just make a number line. I like to label this number line with what I'm going to put on it. So on this number line, I am going to put F prime of X. That just allows me to uh, keep track of exactly what I'm putting on here. And now the only points that I'm going to put on here are going to be my critical points. So now that corollary to the mean value theorem that we had on the previous page says the only place where this can change from increasing to decreasing or the other way around is at these critical points. It has to be constant in each of these intervals. Now we've got some options on how we can find out whether we have an increasing or decreasing on each interval. We could come up with test points in between each of these sections to find out the sign of F prime on each interval. Like for example, between negative two and two, I happen to know that there's a number called zero. If I plug in zero, which is in between negative two and two, into F prime, I'm going to get 3 times 0 squared, so 3 times 0, 0 minus 12, I'm going to get a negative value. Long story short, any number in between negative 2 and 2 is going to give me a negative. I could have plugged in 1, 3 times 1 squared minus 12, that's 3 minus 12, that's negative 9. I only care that it's a negative, because now I know between this point and this point, this whole interval has to be decreasing. In order to find out to the left of negative 2, I just choose some number that is less than negative 2. Don't just assume that it's going to uh, produce a, uh, a positive value. You do have to actually check it. Easiest way here is to just plug in some numbers to the left of negative 2, like negative 3, negative 100. Uh, if I put in negative 10, I get 3 times 10 squared minus 12, 3 times 100 minus 12, 300 minus 12. I don't care what the actual value is, I just care that it's positive. Over here, I do the same thing, something to the right of 2. Uh, 10. 3 times 10 squared minus 12. 300 minus 12. That's positive as well. So this indicates where the function is increasing and decreasing. Now this question doesn't ask it, but we can also figure out whether these points are local maxima or minima. Looking at this, if I have an increasing function, that's a positive slope. If I have a decreasing function, that's a negative slope. I can actually find out that at negative 2, I have a maximum on this function. And even further, on this interval, decreasing, coming out of negative 2, increasing. I can find out that there's a minimum at 2. And we'll practice this again tomorrow, because this is a massively huge and important thing. But this question is just asking, Where does the function increase? And the function increases from the left of negative 2 all the way up to negative 2. That's from negative infinity all the way up to negative 2. Where else does it increase? The other interval starts at 2 and goes all the way up to infinity. Where does the function decrease? The function is going to decrease on whatever interval I have a negative for. And remember, it turns around at negative 2 and 2. So between negative 2 and 2, regardless of what number I put in there, I'm going to have a negative value for my slope. Now, again, this uh, question doesn't ask for the maximum and minimum, but I know that I have a maximum at x equals 2 which is going to be uh, f of, wait, f of, maximum was at negative 2, oops, f of negative 2. If I plug in f of negative 2, that's going to be negative 2 cubed minus 12 times negative 2, so that's going to be negative 8 plus 24. I have a maximum, a local maximum, of 16. I have a minimum at x equals positive 2, which 
is f of positive 2, which is equal to 2 cubed minus 12 times 2. 8 minus 24 would be equal to negative 16. So just to show you guys that I'm not crazy, that I actually do have uh, some, some know-how on this. Whoops. I'm hooking up my calculator here. And if I plug in the original function of x cubed minus 12x, ah, dang it, helps if I put it up here, x cubed minus 12x, adjust my window just a little bit. Uh, it looks like uh, I want to include negative 2 and 2, so I'm possibly going to go from negative 5 up to 5. Uh, let's count by 1s here. I happen to know that my uh, minimum value on there was a uh, negative 16, so maybe I can go down to negative 20. My maximum value was positive 16. So now looking at this graph, I've actually clearly found where the maximum and minimum are without actually graphing it my maximum at negative 2. It's at 16. My minimum at 2. It's at negative 16. Again, this only deals with local or relative extrema, but hey, it's better than nothing, right? A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Let's see what we have here. There we go. Corollary to this functions with f prime equals 0 are constant. We pointed this out last uh, last section. So if f prime equals zero at each point of an interval, then there is a constant for which f of x is equal to c for all x in i. You always use c here. It's called the constant of uh, integration, but we'll get into that later. Uh, whether that really comes up is something like this. If f prime of x equals g prime of x at each point of an interval, then there is a constant c such that f of x equals g of x plus c for all x in i. Basically, if two functions have the same derivative, then they just have their vertical translations of each other is what we're looking at here. That's kind of complicated, but what it gets applied to is finding something called a, um, an underivative here. Let's pretend that the function f of x has a derivative of negative cosine of x and it passes through 0, 5. So we happen to know that f prime of x is equal to negative cosine of x. We're going to undifferentiate this function, so we have to think what function differentiates into negative cosine. We look back at our, back at our rules from last chapter, and we just kind of work backward we see that the derivative of sine is cosine, so the derivative of negative sine should be cosine. So f of x is going to be negative sine of x, but we have to use what we had on that last page where we say when we're undifferentiating, we always use the plus c. Now we just have to solve for c. This becomes what's called an initial value problem where we know that f of 0 is equal to negative sine of 0 plus c. Well, we also know that f of 0 is equal to 5. So we just solve that for c now. We've got negative sine of 0. Well, sine of 0 is just 0. We've got negative 0 plus c equals 5. Solving for c, we've just got c equals 5. So the function f of x that has a derivative of negative cosine of x and goes through 0, 5 is f of x equals negative sine of x plus 5. I called it undifferentiating, but it really has a name. It's called an antiderivative. A function capital F of x is an antiderivative of a function f of x if capital F prime of X is equal to lowercase f of X for all X in the domain of F. The process of finding an antiderivative is called antidifferentiation. It's not really called antidifferentiation. It has a different name, but we're not getting into the name of it right now. It's actually a really tricky process. As of right now, you're just using your rules 
to find the antiderivatives. So let me see here. Find the velocity. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to save this. We're going to talk about antiderivatives uh, tomorrow. We're not going to talk about that, uh, uh, that problem that I had up there. I think we've had enough uh, for one day here. Antiderivative is the last thing that we're going to talk about. If you take an antiderivative, one important thing to remember, just like I did in this problem, don't forget your plus C. That is majorly important. If you guys are good, I have a joke for you tomorrow. So that being said, here's some practice problems for you to try out, and I will see you manyaro.